Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by a guest who I normally wouldn't have prospected to come on the show, but we got an intro to him, and I'm super pumped because we're talking about an, we're going to get an outsider's perspective on how to build a great training training program for your sales team. Normally we have people on here, they've come from sales, they've been sales managers, VPs, directors, et cetera. And the reason I was excited to get Kyle on the show is he has a very, very different background from most guests. Uh, but without further ado, Kyle Van Pelt, welcome to the show. Colin, thanks so much for having me. You know, I'm passionate about, uh, if nothing else, training, just because you know my background uh, has really seen the value of that. I spent just over 20 years in the US Air Force uh, what I did there ranged everywhere from, uh, you know, building up jet engines from the ball bearings to uh, operationally testing them on a test cell to uh, working on uh, MH-53 helicopters, uh, you know, a picture of which I've uh, got honorarily hung on my wall here. And uh, we, we worked with special forces from around the world doing all kinds of really fun and crazy things. And after all that time, uh, I spent about 10 years in that environment, I came back and did training. Uh, training for me was uh, a way to give back. It was a way to reinvest in the company, which because that's what the military is, a big company. Um, it was a way to reinvest in there, taking what I had learned and help make the, the next uh, group of folks that are going to come out and do that same job better. They're going to come work for the people that I work with that didn't, you know, mm -hmm. they, they're still out there. I'm going to be feeding them and, and the, 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 the new recruits coming out. And believe me, I heard from them if, uh, if I sent them somebody that didn't resonate so well. So, so I saw that value there. And then after that, I, I did uh, from the basic skills training, I moved on to some advanced skills training, everything from uh, mishap investigation to uh, you know, senior leader soft skills training and uh, some change management things associated with rolling out resilience programs across an installation and, and helping uh, a little bit anyway, uh, rolling that out to the Air Force level. After all that, I got to, you know, talk the talk, time to go back and see if you can walk the walk. So I went back to an operational environment, again, back with uh, special operations. And it was a great time to see the end result of the training product that I had been working on for about so seven years. So 10 years operational, seven years uh, working in training, and then they, in, in various respects, and then back the last three-ish years uh, in the Air Force was spent putting that all to use, seeing those products out in the field with my personal experience in the operational and training side. And what I really saw was several different training pipelines uh, and channels really come together and got to see what that looked like on a flight line, downrange in a deployed environment. Uh, admittedly, that's, that's a great proving ground to, to see if your training is really worth what it's uh, cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. I remember when we did the pre-interview, you talked about, you know, a little bit about the differences between sort of the C-130 versus the, C the CV-22, sort of the yeah. something that had an established program versus something that was a brand new program. Yeah. So yeah, great examples. Uh, the C-130, I think it started in 1953. It was the first time it flew. Uh, and that has had, you know, all kinds of experience worldwide from many different air forces. It's a very mature platform. It just, we, we, we basically know dang near everything about it. And the training pipeline for that, in addition to the technical guidance, uh, troubleshooting, uh, just the tribal knowledge of what people have grown up with is many generations old, especially in a highly iterative process of a military environment where people turn over so much and, that, and stuff is, is, is developed quickly. Uh, and again, you know, hey, our recent conflicts have really gone a long way toward advancing that knowledge and familiarity with, with that platform. Uh, juxtapose that with the CV-22. So I grew up, as, as, as uh, I alluded to earlier, on the MH-53. That, that also started in the 50s. Uh, but then it transitioned. It, it, it was phased out in 2008 for the Air Force anyway. The, the Navy and the Marines uh, still fly those. Uh, but when it comes to the CV-22, you know, pretty much the most, uh, the newest uh, platform, uh, certainly in special operations as far as a, as a manned aerial vehicle goes. And what the CV-22 represents is a brand new, not just uh, new, you know, numbers and letters for, so, so for those of you unfamiliar, CV-22 Osprey is the one where the, the engines are like pointed up and it takes off like a helicopter and then they go down and the propellers are pointing forward and it flies around like an airplane. I can do the sound effects later if you need me to. I would love to, yeah. <laughs> that would be for like the, the, the outtakes role. I'm sure you do one of those. Uh, 
Uh, you, you'll let me come back to that. But uh, the CV22, again, since it's so different, again, it's a new airframe, but it represents a new type of flying. So now you've got, it, it's not just another airplane, it's a helicopter and an airplane put together. So the, the, the newness is exponentially ma uh, magnified uh, in the fact that the training, uh, both for flight crews and maintenance and everything, and, and even people that manage these resources, they're just not used to uh, managing a unique resource. They're used to managing helicopters and they're used to managing airplanes. We've been doing that for a long time. But just the, mm -hmm. the learning curve involved with learning how to manage an airplane over a tank, uh, that's a learning curve, right? It's to a smaller degree multiplied by this. So what I saw was a CV-22, uh, this Osprey in the operational environment, the training pipeline was, you know, there was a lot of awesome people there, a lot of effort was put and resources were put toward training, but it just wasn't mature enough. So the results weren't what we were seeing in a C-130 environment that had so many more established practices of 50 plus years of operational experience. And I, I, I want to get to, you know, the main part of the episode, but I, I'd love to sort of drill in here. What were, what were some of the differences? Like, obviously the, and we don't have to get into a technical sure. perspective because all, all that my brain heard when you said CV-22 and explained it <laughs> was, was going like this, right? That's it. I was like, this man worked on transformers, which is, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, yeah, I actually did. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the air force uh, aircraft that were in the transformers movie, I had the privilege of being on at one point or another. That's very cool. Okay, so small trivia. You remember the first Transformers movie uh, where the AC-130 is flying around shooting at the little scorpion thing swimming in the sand? Yeah. So I've, I've been, I, that was one of my airplanes at one point. And if you're familiar, uh, they have on the, on the side of the airplane, like, like the kills, they'll paint the kills. So okay. we, were, we were going back and forth and uh, wax and Taliban and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we, right interspersed with all that was a Decepticon logo where we had nailed a uh, Decepticon. So you actually you had actually painted one on on the plane that you guys were on. Yeah, that that's was amazing. in the movie. Yeah. So. <laughs> True story. Uh, that's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. No, what can I what, what can I tell you as as far as that? I don't know, side so I just want to compare contrast like with the uh, the motion of building the uh, um, operating the the maintenance and the training program for the CV-130 versus what, what did you have to do differently with the CV-22? And not from a technical perspective, mm -hmm. but more from a training and development, like building that program perspective. Because obviously there's a yeah. lot of things new. You have, you've got a lot of iteration cycles that you haven't done as compared with the CV-130. Well, I think the, the, the main difference between the uh, C-130 and the CV-22, if we could compare it, you know, trying to tie into the uh, building training programs for a sales team is a new product. Maybe uh, you don't quite know what the KPIs are. Maybe the cash conversion cycle or, or something else like that really is different. Uh, I had a buddy that uh, had a business selling uh, wild grass seed uh, and it's very seasonal. It comes around once a year. It's a very established market, but if you're, if you're uh, you know, a conglomerate or something that has a lot of companies that is focused on a quicker conversion, uh, then that's, that's just gonna be different. You're really gonna have to understand the differences in that business. And that's what I think the CV22 represented. It had a lot of differences, those KPIs and, because uh, KPIs would drive everything, right? Operations, sales for sure. Uh, and I would argue training, that it has to be all the same KPIs and that's what's gonna align all that effort and make it efficient and, and make it uh, value added for folks. Um, when it comes to the CV-22, in many respects, juxtaposed with the C-130, we're figuring out a lot of what those were. Mm -hmm. And so did you, like, as you're building the, the training playbook, are you, like, what did, what did those iteration cycles look like? Like, how did you, how are you pulling that new knowledge of, hey, this is different or this needs to evolve from the people that are actually, you know, conducting the maintenance? Right. So my role at that point was a little more limited. I was no longer in the, the training uh, role, but what we would feed back kind of as an organization is these are the types of problems we're having. And when we get someone from tech training, uh, you know, they're unfamiliar with this system or, or we get them in training here, but, but, but in actuality, this is what we need them to do. And excuse me, aligning training objectives with operational objectives made the training more value added because they would show up knowing what they, we, what they needed to know for them to be effective for us. Uh, and uh, some of the changes that in, in previous experience, so I, I just to give you an example, not specifically the CV-22, uh, engine maintenance was, was really good at, 
you know, knowing all the components of the engine. Whereas, you know, another role crew chief maintenance, who we're talking about, you know, marshaling aircraft, you know, you can tell somebody how to marshal an aircraft, use NATO hand signals and all this other kind of stuff as a poster on it. But unless you get in front of a, of a huge aircraft making a lot of noise with a pilot that's actually going to do what you tell them to do, there's a disconnect that you probably need to do that once or twice live in a training environment uh, with in front of a real aircraft before you go in the operational environment. So that's just like, okay, well, hey, let's add this to the pipeline. Right on. And just to fast forward today from, sure. there, from there to today a little bit. So now you're VP of operations at Simple Bills. So can you tell us a little bit about just what you're involved in now that you're not uh, making sure helicopters and transformers fly? <laughs> right. So um, it's, it's funny, they joked with me. Uh, so we at Simple Bills, we manage utilities for uh, properties across the country. And they say, hey, you're doing it here. Now you're no longer, you know, getting deployed to, to, to war zones. It'd be a lot safer and a lot less stress. And I was like, yeah, I thought so too. But uh, Turns out a college student without Wi-Fi is not something to be messed with. So, <laughs> but uh, right now what I do is, uh, like I said, VP of operations, but in the, that is the training uh, for our company and for our customers. So what I'm focused on is understanding where training fits into the operational cycle, how to incorporate it and what to instruct. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very lucky. We've just uh, brought on a, a new dedicated training person. I actually started here at Simple Bills uh, with the training and uh, kind of gave it its first iteration. So, so now we're really uh, doing that next iteration and maturing it. And I'm really excited about the fact that training is going to report to the highest levels of the company. Um, it's going to be driven off of the operational requirements that are, are are, are important to uh, the operations side, the business development side, and the customer side, because our corporate clients need this product to work for their, their uh, site level staff. I know I'm kind of technical on my side, but really the same thing that's gonna make business development happy to sell more deals really is the same thing that's gonna make training effective. If, I, if I've got training that makes somebody really good at doing something that does not increase our bottom line, I've gotta evaluate why we're doing that what value it's actually bringing to the company. Right on. And, and nobody's going to be surprised that, that uh, Kyle was a referral from, uh, I, I want to say it was Justin and Kyle, the, the lesson league guys. It was, it was. Yeah. So, so Justin, I know he's, he's recently uh, been on office. I love that guy. Uh, and lesson Lee has been a, a huge uh, boon for us as far as delivering training um, because it's, it's, it's been, it's been exactly what, what worked for us and it's helped us kind of implement. Right on. Uh, one of the things that I like about sort of in your role is like you said, uh, training now has sort of a seat at the table with you being BPA operations and training rolling up to you. Yes. Um, Cause in our pre-interview, we were talking about sort of the um, you know, more of the air force analogy, but you had mentioned that sort of training doesn't really it is impossible to compete with actually making sure that the helicopters are in the air. Oh, you're so right. It, when it comes to training, uh, you know, you look at all the things you got to do in a day and, you know, I lose this deal if I don't close circle with this customer. You know, I, I go late on, you know, half a million dollars in invoices with late fees if I don't pay this bill. And, and all the way down the road, if I don't do this training, I can do it tomorrow is really what it comes down to. And so one-to-one, -one, there's no comparison. Uh, like It doesn't hold a candle, right? It's, it's never going to win on that level. And I think a lot of that's because training has been implemented in, in, in a way that puts, that makes that the equation. Uh, when in fact, if we can change how training, if we can change that equation to where training directly supports and is built in a way that is exactly in line with operations and, and making it have the same seat at the table, right? You, you no longer have two people competing for the same resources in which one will always lose. Uh, even in the air force, uh, we had training departments that set our whole squadrons and wings and stuff de dedicated to training that's important. As you get bigger, you need more infrastructure and bureaucracy. Uh, there's just no way around that. It's just required. Uh, however, the fidelity you lose in bifurcating the training from operations has a, has a price it pays. And, and the bigger you get, that's a bigger monster to, to help slay is, is that, that separation between operations and training. So you know, one of my huge, uh, goals in operations is to keep that from separating so that uh, the, I get, you know, the way you change the equation is, is from going today, one to one, I can close a deal or I can accomplish a training. You change it to the, if 
my salesperson, my employee has the training, they are going to be more effective. And this is how I know. And I, you know, you're going to have to budget your time. And, and at no point am I, would I ever look at somebody with a straight face and tell them, no, it's more important that you, you know, spend 20 minutes reading this uh, SOP or this, this policy uh, than it is to, to call a client. Absolutely not. But you're going to have to rely on people's maturity and, and prioritization to, to understand the value of that. Just like saving money. I don't need, I don't need my 401k tomorrow. But when I'm 65, I'm going to be looking for it, right? But somehow yeah. people find time in their day and their, and their resources to save for that. And it's uh, the, the way you just make it more relevant is, is, is really not look at training in terms of good test scores uh, and, and a bunch of other training specific KPIs, but in terms of operational KPIs. And we're going to get into sort of your, your thoughts, your opinions on how to build a great training program in a second. But I do, okay. I really love that analogy of sort of the, you know, like your 401k, because training is one of those things that, you know, the miracle of compound interest is really going to pay you off in the long yes. run. You know, it's, it's short term. Sure. It makes more sense to make that call because I can get that, you know, I can hit my KPI this week, this month, today. But if I'm not making that long-term investment in sort of sharpening the saw, so to speak, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, in a year from now or in five years or in 10 years from now, I'm going to be, you know, just look at one of those charts that says, okay, if I start with, if I have, you know, if I'm paying, if I'm getting straight line interest on my, you know, $10,000 that I invested today versus if I'm getting compound interest at, you know, um, and, and you look at, you know, the, how divergent those paths are over time, oh, right? Yeah. Like that's sort of the difference of your career versus sort of your career with the compound interest of continuous of, of training. training. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to, to, to training and, and looking at that, yeah, you know, I talked to my directors and I said, Hey, write down your goals at the beginning of the year, at some point in the year. And then let's look at them in a year because if, without training, without actually investing in processes, we're going to be exactly where we are right now, adjusted for the ratios of banning. We won't have made any efficiencies and all we can do is add it arithmetic uh, to expansion. And that's not sustainable. It's nobody, nobody grows a company uh, tenfold that way. The way you grow is by making it more efficient and getting better processes. And you're going to have to do that with smarter people. hundred percent. Cool. I'm just adding an image in case anybody that doesn't get the, doesn't understand the analogy. I'm going to throw that in the links section here. You can see the uh, compound interest versus simple or straight, straightforward interest. Fabulous yeah. idea. And, uh, and the more I think about it, the more, you know, 401k is a great analogy for training. hundred percent. Almost like we planned this out ahead of time. Yeah. Which we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I love the operations owns training and you had mentioned, you'd alluded to something earlier that the purpose of training should be aligned around the, t the team's core metrics. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more there? Uh, yeah. And that's something I always struggled with, uh, in, in the training I went through, uh, both in the military and in college. And it really centered around, well, wait, you're telling me to do this, but I know when I get out and do my, my real job, I'm going to be doing this. Well, there's two problems there. One is that there's a difference, right? The other thing is that I'm looking at training as being different than my real job. Uh, mm. That right there is a huge red flag to me. When, when, when we're talking in training and we're having to say, okay, this is training. When you really do this, it's like, well, why am I not just really doing it now? You lose a lot of that. And that, that threshold between training and operations is necessarily there, right? We don't want to take a guy off the street and have him talk to a customer right away and, and figure it out. Uh, however, uh, how we go about doing that can, can be more or less efficient. A hundred percent. I, I can't. Yeah. The, the amount of, of sales training that I've gone through um, <laughs> where I'm like, how, how is this going to like, I don't need to know what the, like the resonance on this sort of alternator is going to be to sell it to a customer. You know, I need to, I need to understand like sort of what the, what the benefits to the customer are. Right, because mm -hmm. that's going to actually help me make a difference. But going through all the different technical level details, there's a time and a place where that's important. Um, but if it's not sort of directly aligned with, okay, this is going to help you do your job better, um, and it's not just sort of like, you know, I think the the symptom of what I've gone through is, you know, here's the training for one department. You know, let's copy paste that for another yeah. department. Right. And so you've got salespeople that are trying to get a technical education. Um, but at the same time, it's the same technical education you might give to one of your engineers or one of your solution engineers or sales engineers. Right. And so it, it, I think what you're saying is not, it's not just about the, 
um, making sure the salespeople are trained. It's making sure that it's aligned with the goals that they're going to be achieving in the in their role. Yeah, and you know, if if I could jump to the to developing a training program, I think that fits really well with that. As far as you develop a, a skeleton, you develop the the structure of what what's what are we going for here? Uh, first, kind of quantifying what we are doing, and then understanding the processes, making sure those make sense. Uh, I found a lot when I was quantifying the processes we do here at Simple Bills uh, and found, you know, okay, well, what I learned, the majority of it was me learning why we did such things, but however, understanding the efficiency of it and helping to modify that helped, but then using that to build the, the skeletal training. Uh, that way, when I needed to train either for a business development or a developer, uh, I had a common roadmap. Everything made sense. Uh, and it, it allowed me to gain the efficiency of interchangeable training modules uh, while at the same time maintaining strategic alignment in terms of, like you said, you know, you don't need all the technical stuff for a salesperson. However, you need, you know, certain things. And, and I, I placed a lot of value when I was uh, teaching jet engines on system knowledge. Uh, you can always look in the book and find out the name to a part. Uh, and how many screws it has, right? However, you've got to know, uh, you know, how fluid fuel, oil, hydraulic fluid, air flows through a jet engine. Uh, and if you understand that concept, you'll be able to figure out what's wrong with it. You might not know what that component is called off the top of the bat, but I can walk up to any jet engine and explain to you, oh, but that's this part, that's this part, this is how it works. And that's the valuable part of a training program is to teach you that innate understanding the human element that allows you to figure out what the problem is. And you can Google search the answer to that after it. You, you're totally right. It's the, it's the understanding of the sort of what you're saying is the base underlying concepts and not necessarily how many screws, where it is. It's yeah. not this like rote memorization. It's more about developing that understanding. Yes. Yes. And one, one cool uh, thing I, I learned was the, uh, I think I, I had it, uh, yeah, so uh, learning taxonomy. I don't know if that's a familiar name to somebody that's not a training geek, but just the levels of learning. So learning kind of starts with knowledge. You know, I can, two plus two is four, you know, but then comprehension of understanding. If I have two blocks over here and four blocks over here, those become four blocks. Uh, I, I comprehend that thing, not just be able to pair it back and answer to you. And then the application, when would you ever need to know that two plus two is four, maybe during a recipe, uh, making, making cookies or something. Uh, and then the analysis phase is looking at it and understanding, okay, well, it's, it's too salty. I need, you know, one of this and three of these. Uh, and then synthesis is the next stage after that, where learners are able to uh, understand it and then replicate it. They could come to a completely new situation and be able to apply those steps to be able to figure out the problem on their own. And then and the last part is evaluation, is evaluating that, that whole process from the outside. That's super interesting. And I, I'm going to throw a link in here. I just did a quick Google search on learning taxonomy and it's, it's Bloom's taxonomy Yes, um, is the, the link that I had found. So I'm going to throw a link in there in case anybody wants to see a cool looking pyramid um, with yeah. what you just shared. And so, so how does this factor in to the training programs that you're developing? Well, it helps me understand how I need to present information and the order in which I need to present it. I need to make sure that people have, like as basic as it may sound, it makes, I have actually spoken to and explained all the different components involved in a process. Uh, when you get two pages into a lesson plan and you bring up new information, that's a red flag and it's gonna confuse the heck out of your learners. Uh, they're like, whoa, I've never seen this before. What are you talking about? So you really gotta set that table where you, okay, this is the vocabulary, the principles, the processes, components, systems, et cetera, that are involved with this and then build off of that. So reference, uh, learners have a common frame of reference. When I speak with someone, I need to make sure they have the same frame of reference. Otherwise, when I talk to them, we're, we're not going to be connecting. Um, th so that knowledge part is really important. Uh, basic lessons about the company, basic lessons about how our business works are, are foundational to every role. Uh, everybody's going to need to know some of those. Uh, when it comes to the next one, comprehension, uh, that tells me uh, how well they need to understand it. So that, while that's the next thing, not, you know, once you, once you know where the break room is, I don't really need you to comprehend it, right? Like we're good there. You can figure it out. Uh, but comprehension is important if it is more germane to your specific role. That's going to, that's going to be important. Um, something and I like just, just before yeah. you move on there, cause I, I do kind of want to go through, like if we're talking about the sort of um, we're trying to build knowledge, what, what specific types of training would you 
uh, would you use to, to sort of help build knowledge? And maybe we can go through sort of one at a time here. You but, mean specific tasks? Yeah, like if, if, we're sure. trying to, if we're trying to improve the sort of people's recall of specific knowledge or specific you know, information, like where the screws are, or like mm-hmm. how many bolts this needs, or like, it, like what type of training program or training module would you, uh, would you try and align to build knowledge? So I've been involved with several different types of training. Uh, one that you know we, we spoke of earlier might be a good parallel between my experience and what business development does is, is training a call center. Uh, and a call center, you know, answering resident questions. When they call in, asking questions about utility bills, uh, we're, we're correcting uh, something on their account or making an adjustment for them and, and explaining to them information about utilities. So first one, taxonomy, knowledge, right? Frame, frame of reference. Uh, as far as the comprehension goes, and uh, excuse me, uh, what types of skills? So I, people would need to know the system knowledge, how our system works. Uh, something that's basically how utilities work. What's a kilowatt hour? Uh, how is gas measured? It's measured in hundred cubic feet per, uh, uh, yeah, hundreds of cubic feet. So CCF, centa, you know, cubic foot, uh, or BTUs, British thermal units, which is the thermal energy unit equivalent of burning that um, volume of gas. Uh, so understanding all this stuff is that knowledge level that helps, uh, you know, in our case, the call center representatives explain to someone, say, what do you mean you're charging me for, you know, 100 CCFs and why I don't understand this. Uh, how are they going to be able to do it? So we got to teach them that skill. Um, when it comes to uh, interacting with customers, another another skill, uh, completely different. So that's more technical. So maybe more of the soft, sky, soft side would be teaching empathy. Um, how do you explain to something? You got to okay, this is what empathy is. Uh, and this is how you, you present it to someone. But the training for those are going to look different. I could teach uh, how to identify what CCF is in a quiz. You know, what's CCF? I give them the acronym and they could choose the definition. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could always look that up. But when it comes to empathy, uh, using this lesson product as an example, what we do is uh, we'll send someone an actual customer's account tell them, okay, this is the problem. And we'll, we can record their screen and their headset as they're explaining. So explain to this fictitious, they're, they're not on the phone, but it's a real, real situation. Explain to them why their bill was twice what it was the month before. So that's, that's the CCF piece for, for gas, but it's also the empathy piece. Now I can hear how they're explaining it and I can give them feedback to that. Hmm. Um, it's even more valuable when they have their supervisor do it, right? Cause now they're being evaluated from the, by the person who is, going to be signing their checks. Um, And that's important because it gets completely rid of, this is how we do it in training, and this is how we do it in operational. The operational person is doing the training. I'm just facilitating the process so that they are using, uh, you know, one-to-one is is my one of my favorite expressions. There's no threshold between operations and training. You you are training on operations. There's no dissimilarity in how we do things. And when it comes to uh, that soft skill, it's going to be evaluated differently because you need a different performance. And that gets back to the KPI piece where uh, if I teach somebody how to score a hundred on a test, that doesn't affect in and of itself has no bearing on the bottom line of the company uh, because we don't take tests for a living. We manage utilities and we make customers ecstatic about the fact that it's super easy to sign up with their electric provider. I mean, it's, it, and I'm telling you, it, we've gotten great reviews and it's hilarious that, that we have such good reviews for a company that parts college students from their uh, <laughs> recreational money to pay their utility bills. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you look at it, that's so that that's our business. And how are we going to be successful in doing that? Well, it's going to be things like showing empathy. And that's how we are able to tie a skill to a KPI because I can look at my Google reviews and I can tell you we're doing great customer service. And it's not because I can tell you what a hundred cubic feet of natural gas is. Awesome. And, and so in terms of like, if we look at the taxonomy here, all the sure. transmission, application, et cetera, are there specific types of modules that line up with each, like specific types of training modules that line up with, like, if I'm trying to teach knowledge, then the best way is a quiz. If I'm trying to teach comprehension, the best way is a role play applic or maybe application would be a role play. Mm-hmm. Do you find that there's sort of like some corollaries there, like some, some tactics that are most helpful, or is it sort of, it's a blend of everything and you're just trying to make sure that you're walking people through sort of each each step along the way as you build that program. Yeah, in my experience, I think I've seen it both ways. I think you're exactly right. There are some methods that lend themselves to different uh, 
different levels in that taxonomy. Um, however, the taxonomy, you can also use it kind of the other direction to tell you to which level you train a given task. Um, mm -hmm. Do I need to just have the knowledge of what, uh, you know, 100 cubic feet of gas is, or do I need to be able to evaluate someone's ability to estimate this and just kind of really go that way? So I use those both together, but uh, I think it is interesting. Yeah, I, well, I use it. I think it's the, the first part I think is more important. I think it's really easy to write tests and it's really easy to administer tests. And then, you know, dang, if, our, if, if, uh, if, <laughs> if our weakness doesn't get us, it's easy to measure tests. So if we want to eat something that's easy to measure, we'll go to a test because you can look at test scores, but that is not always the best channel. So if I'm trying to teach empathy and I'm trying to teach a soft skill, or if I'm trying to just, you know, grasp something that's good, they're exponentially more valuable, uh, mm -hmm using training, using uh, testing because it's easy to administer and measure really does it a disservice. And the, the biggest disservice is that it negates or really decreases the value of training to the learner. And it, it, it is, you're spending a lot of time and energy, none the least of which are your employees time and energy and their investment. When people show up to a job, they're excited. I, I we, we're hiring a lot of people and uh, we're looking at trying to double next year. Wow. And so we're hiring a lot of people. It's really exciting, right? So we have all these people coming in with great energy. The, the easiest way to turn them off is park them in front of their computer for four days and tell them to click through PowerPoints, right? That's going to be like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that, yeah. they're going to go from PowerPoint to Indeed very quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so looking at ways is like, hey, yeah, I got to tell you where you know some technical things are, but when it comes to how we're going to train you on your job, we're going to go right into it and doing it, and people will start to to catch that. Uh, and so looking for channels that that. Uh, apply not only to the taxonomy of of the level of learning, like how well we're trying to teach them, which I think is what they kind of meant by taxonomy, uh, like the graduated levels for a given skill, uh, mm -hmm. but understanding that the subject matter really does lend itself to a certain method of instruction and not to shortcut that process because, uh, you know, it's it's a shortcut until it's not, right? <laughs> until you do it in a year later and we're still back at the same spot. I, I like the way you apply that taxonomy and sort of use that as your guideline of, or um, as just a way of measuring how deep do I need to teach this one particular piece as opposed yeah. to, Hey, I'm going to go to the similar level of depth on every different piece um, that they're going to learn today. It's going to be, okay, some of these things I need to, I just need to have the knowledge. Some of them I need to like make it all the way to application. Some I need to make it all the way to sort of synthesis or evaluation. Um, yeah. So there are certain pieces where, like you mentioned about like how the fluids mix and work together within an engine, you need to get very deep on that. But in terms of the, where do the bolts go, right? That we can just sort of stick at the knowledge because you can go with that or look it up in a handbook and it's not as essential to know why a certain bolt pattern is a certain way because it doesn't necessarily have, like it's not going to be applicable to sort of solving the long-term goal. Yeah. And you know what, for any aircraft maintenance folks out there, always look at the technical order. That tells you exactly all that technical stuff. So <laughs> that's my caveat on all of that. So it's just so nobody blows up my email about, uh, about that. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so from, from a new employee perspective, if I'm, yeah. if I've just got hired at simple bills, what is this, what does a training program look like from your perspective? Like what, or from my perspective, what am I going to see? What am I going to go through? Sure. So using that call center representative and it's pretty similar throughout our company. The first day and a half is going to be, you know, Hey, welcome to the company. We'll do a little bit of team building, sit, we, we do have uh, just some, some uh, administrative stuff that we just need to present paperwork. Uh, but after about the first day to, to three days, depending upon the job, we're completely done with all the classroom uh, formal training stuff. Uh, we've, we've really gotten through the, the, the kind of a first look at everything. And then they now transition to the call center floor where they'll be at their terminal in a set of headsets. And we will continue the training in the exact same environment they'll be performing operationally. We'll be looking at the same systems. Um, you know, they have a couple of screens up and, and I'll have my screen on one side, they'll have their screen on the other, I'll be on their headsets and I'll be walking them through different programs and we'll be asking questions, but we're doing it in the environment of the call of the call center where they'll be operating with the equipment, the chair they're gonna be sitting in and everything because we found that, uh, and studies bear this out, if you, if you have a training environment and you get a really high level, whatever time you invest in that, as soon as you go to an operational environment, you lose a lot in that transition. So we we go to that operational environment as quickly as humanly possible. Um, and it, and it's proven to uh, pay off some it's great yeah. dividends. Re really interesting. I've, I've, I've read a little bit of the, the literature there on okay. the, 
that uh, learning seems to be context specific. And so mm-hmm. if you are learning in your, if you're studying in your classroom, there were studies that showed that you actually perform better on the test if you took, if you had sort of prepared for that test in the same room versus preparing at home or preparing in the library. And I'm, I'm sort of cribbing and, and like paraphrasing quite a bit here. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm, I can't recall the exact, or like the exact details of the study and what they, what they did to test, but you had a really interesting example of, you know, uh, the first time somebody would make it out onto the, onto the tarmac. Oh and- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a great example. You know, we, earlier we talked about, you know, the, it's different getting in front of an operating aircraft and it, and it really is. It's, you can tell somebody all day long, you know, Hey, these are the red lines. Don't go outside of here. These big old warnings. I mean, if you've ever walked next to an airplane at an airport or anything else like that, they've got these huge caution tape all over the place. And you know what? You got to wonder, how dumb are people? You know, this is like, can't you just put like a regular sign? Why has it got to be eight foot high and yellow? Uh, but the reason is because when you get into an operational environment, the stress comes on. You've got, you know, science, will, will, science shows that, you know, noise, vibration, um, temperature, wind, weather, different things like that, uh, completely separate to the geographic change and the, the, you're around different people, you're wearing different things. Um, the temperature of, 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 you know, being cold or hot, um, it makes your mind blank. I know it does for me. Uh, you just kind of got to start all over and relearn things. And when I took new guys out there, you know, helicopters are notorious for having a lot of sharp things flying around. You know, I would literally have a hand on the back of their jacket and just, just to make sure they didn't wander off into something that was going to be dangerous for them or for me. Uh, but it's, it's uh, luckily in a call center, it's a lot easier, but it's the same principle. You know, uh, we found that we would spend three or four days uh, getting everybody really comfortable with everything in a training environment, take them to the operational environment and set us back two days. Now we do a day and a half to two days in the training environment, go to the operational environment. And we sit back about four hours or so of, of training just because we can't ever make everything hundred percent, but mm-hmm. you know, we save an entire day. Right. Which is huge. Yeah. And so, so basically you get them into their seat as quickly as possible. How, how soon is it until they're live and talking to, to potential customers? We, we, we allow two weeks for training. Uh, so once they get into that seat, I'll take them uh, or the training person will take them through the, the syllabus and working live tickets, just understanding things and, and you know, the crawl, uh, walk, run process. And then we'll actually hand them off to some floor supervisors who will do the same thing. It'll be someone else changing. So we're, we're changing their environment with the same people, the instructors, and then we change the people with the same environment, the operational work center. And that is a great stair step approach and it helps them build their relationship with their gaining supervisor. A one from a position of strength. They already know a little bit of what they're talking about. They've already been doing the job they can navigate. They're not feeling like brand new folks. Uh, so that helps that relationship get jump started. The supervisor doesn't have to be, uh, have, you know, years in training to understand how to connect with people. They already have a lot of common framework, that, that knowledge aspect that we talked about earlier, that, that common vocabulary. So they're able to mm-hmm. kind of jump right into it. And they spend anywhere from four days to, 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 to eight days uh, working out the rest of those things, getting folks comfortable, but showing them all kinds of different things before they, they kind of cut them live. So we, like I said, we allow two weeks, but usually uh, folks are chopping at the bits. as they put me in coach. So we, we generally never go the, the full two weeks because they're, they're feeling confident and ready to, to talk that's, to customers. That's great. And so can you walk me through like the table of contents or the sort of the skeleton of that program for that, the first two weeks where somebody's going from new hired and you're holding them by the back of the by, back of their jacket to you're letting them out in the wild. Yeah. So uh, we'll talk to them about, you know, the history of the company. we got a great history. We started by two college roommates who couldn't sort out utility bills. Uh, 10 years later, here we are part of a $6 billion company that's worldwide, uh, helping all kinds of uh, real estate professionals, business to business, uh, you know, make the most of their portfolios. Um, it, it, we started in 2008, you know, the, reset, the great recession, great time to not start a company, but they did great. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so we, we teach them about this, the history of the, of the company. Then we teach them about like the basics of how we interact with our, uh, our, uh, our customers. We have several different customer groups and how that business model really works to uh, help serve those customers and meet a need and how our goals are actually aligned with our customers, which makes our job significantly more easy. We're not, 
we're not trying to sell someone something so we can benefit and then they get something they want. We are both working toward a, to a shared goal. Um, so walking them through that business model, again, that whole system knowledge aspect of it. So when they're confronted with a, with a question about how to serve a customer, how to evaluate a process or implement a decision, they have the same framework that the customer does and that, that our company shares and helps them make better choices. So we, we share that. And then we start to get it, okay, specifically how your role is going to affect this. So kind of set that whole table of kind of what need bore the company out, how we've implemented that to date and in our customer groups and how kind of the big picture. And then we narrow it back down to here's your role in the picture now that you're able to to kind of share and understand how you fit into that. Perfect. And, and you've talked about this sort of building the systems knowledge. Um, what is that like? What does that specifically look like? Is that you know, you're, are we sitting in class? You're teaching me this. You're teaching me that. Is it? Um, are there exercises? Like, what is that? If we jump into like, if we really zoom in, what is like? How sure. do you go about making sure I fully can grok and understand how um, you know the the, the business model and business model works and how our customers are, you know, how we're really aligned there. Well, so I'm a visual person, uh, but I know not everybody is. Uh, so you got visual auditory and uh, doing. Uh, so we try to hit all those uh, big pictures. I, you know, we, we have some, you know, custom made illustrations that will kind of show it that way. Um, I've, I've worked on how I present uh when, when I'm speaking with someone so that I can explain it in, in an efficient manner that, presents it chronologically and logically uh, and kind of help those things kind of both work together uh, as well as written uh, stuff. So I, I know that's kind of a non-answer. So personally, I like the picture. Uh, I think the picture we show just kind of really, say, oh, okay, I get it. It's really simple. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of start from there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And so I'm, and so basically if we're zooming back out again, so we're, yeah. I'm, I'm a new hire. I've just gone through the first two weeks of training. Is that where training ends? You're now you're, you're that's where, your that's where the, the formal training ends. Uh, what we try to do is we try to make training, uh, not like a, like a monster or anything particularly unique. That way you don't necessarily graduate so much as you're now oper you're now autonomous. Uh, you could have, you could, you've actually been working operational tickets for a week and a half, uh, and because after you're done with that phase, you're going to, every, we, we have software pushes regularly. We have policy changes. We have efficiencies that we realize are able to implement. Uh, do we go back to training? I don't like that connotation. Uh, so I try to stay away from it. Uh, so yes. Yeah. You want to call it the graduate? Sure. But uh, we're always, Hey, this is new. And we, we've invested in this process. Here's some new information to help you be better. Cool. Do we call it training? No, it just, Hey, here's this. So, so how do you, how do you push a push? Well, let's call them updates, sure. right? You guys are updating your, you know, company operating system and you, you know, Apple has been bothering me to, to click that button. Right. And I know it's good for me, but it's still, it's a pain in the ass to, you know, I got to shut everything down. I got to leave the yeah. computer open overnight. Like how do you make sure that, you know, you're building, you're weaving in that these sort of critical updates into uh, people's day-to-day -day life. So yeah, luckily for us, we can just push it. We don't have to wait for somebody to push the button. <laughs> uh, but when we roll it out to the team, uh, and if I kind of digress back to Les and Lee, uh, we're able to, depending upon if it's a really uh, simple change, we can just list it. Uh, we'll build like little gifts that just, oh, if you click here, go over here, this option is now available for you. Uh, or it's, it's down to exercises. Hey, you know, so we've rolled out this new, uh, you know, whatever, uh, here's some information on it. Now kind of explain it back to me or just, and again, that gets back to that taxonomy. What, to what level do we need them to be able to utilize and implement this information? And that, that just really folds right back into our, our learning channels and, and methodologies. Um, yeah, as far as that goes, uh, one of the really cool things is our company is very growth oriented, very, very, very open mindset oriented. And when these changes come out, it's because a couple of months ago, somebody put a suggestion in. So many times folks are waiting at the bit for that change to come out, that, mm -hmm. that notification, that training, the lesson they deal, because they want to see their idea implemented and they want to see how, okay, now it's easier. I can do this. Gotcha. It, it, you're, you're reading my mind because that was sort of the, <laughs> the, last, the last question I was going to ask you. Like, how do you, you know, we've talked about how to implement it. We've talked about how you sort of keep it going, but like, how do you make sure it actually gets put into practice and, and like yeah. continually updated? Well, uh, uh, it's real simple. It, it can't suck. 
uh, when it get, when, you know, how many times have we taken training or done something and we're like, I know this is how I got to do it, but this sucks. Uh, you got to take that part out of it. Uh, again, if you, if you're looking at your training curriculum and, uh, you've got maintenance instructions on typewriters and you're not a typewriter company, probably need to get rid of that. When it comes to these updates and different things like that, if we're not doing it, take it out, cultivate it, curate the training offerings and processes, SOPs, make them congruent so they're not, they don't get out of step with each other, and then make sure that they're all value added and re-look re at them. And when folks complain about something or have a problem with something, or if you're paying attention to your folks, you notice production-wise you're running into a bottleneck, look at the SOPs and training first. Uh, people get out of bed in the morning wanting to do a good job. Nobody's feet hit the floor saying, I'm going to go suck at my job today. They get up thinking, okay, let's give it a shot. I mean, I'm voluntarily going to work, right? You know, once they get there, all bets are off, right? Maybe they, they, they stub their toe or get coffee spilled on them. But, uh, you know, if we can just take that and translate it directly into what we need employees to do, they're going to they're going to get that feeling of accomplishment and they're going to, they're going to, they're going to catch the bug to that because, okay, that's I can understand why that happened. Okay. Now I see why that's important. And now they're doing it. Uh, and it, and it just gets back to training can't be loaded down with a bunch of things that don't fit. Uh, case in point, you know, when, uh, when somebody does uh, makes a mistake, you know, too many times the, the burden falls on training. Do we need to tell people not to do that? Absolutely. But generally, you're going to figure that part out real quick. You don't need a whole other hour training long session not to do X, right? So mm -hmm. training takes the place of accountability or what might be a management issue. And that's, that's a really big no-no in my mind. Uh, we had the uh, analogy in the, in the Air Force, you know, one person craps their pants, everybody wears diapers. Uh, that's bad training. Yeah. <laughs> What a great analogy to sort of leave everybody with. Uh, Glad I could help. Yeah. And, and I, I, re I really like where you come from because I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the training piece, it, it can be seen as a bit of an obstacle, but really like your goal is to help people be excellent at their jobs. Yes. Right. And if you think about like, what is it that people really want? You know, I, I think everybody that I interview, everybody's talking about growth. Everybody's yeah, talking about how they want to kill yeah. it. And it's the sort of, it's the role of the company to make sure that we are actually executing on and giving them the ability to be great at their job. But if we don't invest in these training resources and these training programs and actually make them a core competency of the organization, then we're not giving people a fair shot at actually being great at their jobs. And it's not their fault. It's our fault as the builders of the company. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Right on. Kyle, it's been so great having you on the show. Really appreciate you coming and sharing your perspective here. Um, I know you guys just got acquired by, by RealPage. Normally we do like a we bit did. of a, I, I like to make people sweat, but why don't you just, you know, let people know how they can reach you and let, let people know what's, uh, what's going on with the RealPage acquisition there. Yeah, uh, yeah, just, just briefly. Uh, so RealPage is a, uh, a worldwide organization uh, that we've got uh, a bunch of employees, a bunch of different uh, kind of business units that really serve uh, real estate in many, uh, many aspects. It's, it's, we're a recent acquisition to them. Um, and I'm still learning all the, all the cool stuff. We do everything from, you know, website development of, uh, of, for, for marketing for a property to business analytics on energy acquisition. Uh, so having that kind of like all together under one umbrella, uh, holds a lot of uh, opportunity for efficiency. Uh, we, we fit, uh, a small part in that is the utility management. My, I say small part, but you know, utilities are a huge expense for properties, but the, uh, it's exciting to just kind of have a lot more resources available to us to serve customers well, and a lot more customers for us to be able to serve as well. Right on. And if people are looking to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach out? Sure. Uh, Kyle at simplebills.com, K-Y-L-E at simplebills.com. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from you if you've got questions. If uh, you, you think I made a mistake, I'm dumb, you got a better idea. I, hey, I learned by getting better. Uh, and uh, I think, hey, if, I, if this training thing is really all I'm saying it is, then uh, I, I'd love to hear a, a better way to do something. Right on. I got one last question for you. It's a toughie. Yeah. How's, your, how's your hide and seek game? <laughs> Funny question. Uh, I'm not that good at it. It, it. it took me like 20 minutes to find everybody last time. <laughs> I love that. And, and I think they, they texted you just before we jumped on the episode. Yeah. So. Yeah. Literally we were jumping on and my, I, I've got one that we have, we like to have a little fun here. And they said, <laughs> literally, okay, come find us smiley face. I'm like, ah, I'm literally jumping onto a podcast here guys. And they're like, okay, that's legit. So 
See, I if, think they're if, all out there right now, but I'm pretty sure they got to pull this stuff together. You're a much kinder person than me because if it, if it was me, I would have just said, I'm on my way. And then I would have <laughs> podcast and let them sweat for an hour. <laughs> yeah, but then I got an hour of uh, people not doing anything. <laughs> That's fair. But then, you know, they just work an hour, extra hour later for all the time that they missed, you know, to make yeah, up for that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Right on. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle.